Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing synaptic tagmin. So we've set up, we've done the setup for this discussion now. We're now going to look at this protein, synaptotagmin. Okay, so let's go on to the other side then. Right, so the first thing to say is that there are actually 19 known different isoforms of synaptotagmin. And I promise you there are 19 different isoforms, even though Wikipedia only seems to think there are 15. 19 isoforms of synaptotagmin. Right? Okay. So, um, which one of them is found in neurons? Is, a que is the question we want to know. Which one is most commonly found in neurons? Well, the most common one is synaptotagmin 1. Okay, so that's the one we'll spend most of our time discussing. Synaptotagmin 2 is also found in neuron axon terminals, but synaptotagmin 1 is the main one. So synaptotagmin 1 or 2, they're both found in neurons and they're both involved in the uh, release of neurotransmitter in response to, um, in response to calcium signaling. Okay, so now what we want to discuss is what's the structure of these? So. Let's say we have our synaptic vesicle here. The synaptotagmin 1 or the synaptotagmin 2 protein, they are found in the membrane of these synaptic vesicles. And I want to stress that some of these synaptotagmin isoforms, some of them aren't even capable of sensing calcium. So they're not all involved in neurotransmission, basically. These are the ones that are involved in neurotransmission. So these are the ones that are relevant to us when we're discussing synaptic uh, mechanisms. Okay, right, so what we now want to discuss is the structure of these synaptotagmin 1 or synaptotagmin 2 proteins which are in our synaptic vesicle. Okay, so let's put a few coloured dots in our synaptic vesicle to illustrate the neurotransmitter. Okay, right, and also I'm going to draw another circle to represent the phospholipid bi there. So the now, I've drawn two lines now to represent the inner and outer leaflets of the phospholipid bi there that make up this vesicle. Okay. All right. So, the structure of synaptotagmin then, or one of two synaptotagmins. Okay, so, it has a membrane-spanning portion, so a portion that sits in the membrane, and this is an alpha helical structure. So, this is a membrane-spanning alpha helix. So, this is a membrane spanning alpha helix. Okay, so now what we want to discuss is what does it have on the cytoplasmic side? Well, it now has two large C2 domains, as they're called, and I will tell you exactly what a C2 domain is. So it has these two C2 domains, and that's it, pretty much. Okay, so these C2 domains are known as C2A, which we'll draw here, and C2B, okay, and they are both what are known as C2 domains, which are a type of protein structure that's capable of sensing calcium, basically, of binding to calcium. So let me colour these in. Here is our C2A domain, and here is our C2B domain in turquoise as well. Right, and this linker between the C2A domain and the C2B domain, this is a linker which contains nine amino acids, basically. Specifically, nine amino acids. Okay, so, to give you the grander picture of this before we discuss C2 domains, and that's going to get very sort of protein structure molecular biology, um, I'm just going to give you the bigger picture. C2A binds free calcium ions. So free calcium ions are capable of coming and binding to the C2A domain. One, two, three, okay? Whereas to the C2B domain, two calcium ions will come and bind here, okay? And the binding is cooperative, basically, okay? So once one has bound, Say, let's say, so to this C2A domain, it's got these three potential binding sites of calcium. Once one calcium has come to bind, it will make it easier then for the second calcium to come and bind, and then the third calcium to come and bind, okay? So the one having already bound will change the affinity of the C2 domain for the next one along. And 
some very clever person has analysed that this is in accordance with a fact that um, Katz found eight years ago when he was doing initial experiments into um, neurotransmission. Katz found, basically, that the uh, amount of neurotransmitter that was released was proportional to the amount of calcium you let in to the power of four. So let me say that again. Okay, so Katz was taking neurons. Let me take a neuron here. Okay, so here's an axon terminal. And he was putting calcium into the axon terminals and measuring the concentration of calcium and also measuring how much neurotransmitter you release. So if you put in calcium, calcium goes in, you get a certain amount of neurotransmitter released. And he found, basically, that if you put in more calcium, you get more neurotransmitter released. And the relation between them is that the amount of neurotransmitter that is released is proportional to the concentration of calcium to the power of 4, basically. So, if you wanted to draw a graph of this, if you wanted to draw a graph of neurotransmission release, uh, neurotransmitter release, sorry, versus calcium concentration on the um, x-axis here, then basically the amount of neurotransmitter released would equal some constant times the calcium concentration to the power of 4. That's what he found all those years ago. And that would look like some very um, steep graph. It would look similar, basically, to a quadratic, but steeper. It's a graph to the power of four, a quartic. And quartics look very similar to quadratics, just steeper. You can plot some of the points for it, if you like. You can put in one, two, three, see what numbers you get, and just plot it off and see that I'm right. OK. Um, and someone worked out, basically, that this... Uh, model of binding is consistent with this calcium concentration to the power of 4 here. Now, you would expect it to be calcium concentration to the power of 5, wouldn't you? Because 5 calciums are binding. However, why is it not? Well, that's because of the cooperativity. So, if, if it was the case that one calcium binds, and then the next calcium binds, and the first calcium binding didn't alter in the slightest the probability of this next calcium binding, you would expect this to be calcium concentration to the power of 5. However, because of the cooperativity, because one binding makes it easier for the next one to bind, that explains why uh, this is only to the power of 4 and not to the power of 5, basically, is what someone has decided upon. God only knows how. Right, uh, so, um, what was I going to discuss next? The C2 domains. What is a C2 domain, then? Okay, so a C2 domain is a type of protein domain that is capable of binding to calcium. Now, it is what is known as a beta sandwich. So I want to explain to you what a beta sandwich is. But in order to do this, what we need to discuss, firstly, is what a beta pleated sheet is from um, molecular biology. So, if I remind you of the basic structure of a protein then, a protein is a polymer of amino acids. So what you do is you, let's say, here is your first amino acid in the protein, okay? So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen off, here's the R group, and then here's the carboxyl group, but then it's bound in an amide link to another amino acid, so let's say this is our next amino acid along in this chain. Again, you will have an, another R group, which I'll call R prime, and then it will continue on. So this is the structure of a protein, basically. Now, what can happen is you can continue this on, and I'll draw this line to denote amino acids continuing on in this polymerization. And what can happen is it can turn back on itself. And what you can get happening is you can get uh, more amino acids linking up, basically. And let me show you down here. So now let me show you the next amino acid along. What if uh, you had something uh, like this, basically? You had the nitrogen coming up here, hydrogen coming up there, carbon here, let's say the R prime, double prime now, going off down there, hydrogen, and then maybe a carbonyl group here. Basically, what you can get is you can get um, the polypeptide folding back on itself like this, and these 
Amide links can form bonds with one another, basically. Okay, and uh, I will give you an example of this by changing what I've drawn. So that I, I'm just going to bring that carboxyl group this side so the picture looks works, basically. Okay, so what can happen is that these amide groups here, okay, so th this is an amide group here, or a peptide link, they combine with each other. So this will be an amide link down here as well. I haven't drawn the carboxyl group, but it will be another amide link. And they combine through hydrogen bonding. So this oxygen here, it's a very electronegative, more electronegative than carbon. So it pulls the electrons in these double bonds towards it, and the electrons spend more time near the oxygen than they do near the carbon. So the oxygen gains a partial negative charge. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, this hydrogen here, uh, it's got a much lower electronegativity than the nitrogen, okay? So, um, the electrons in the bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, they spend most of their time around the nitrogen. So the hydrogen gains a partial positive charge, basically. In addition, this oxygen has lone pairs of electrons here. It actually has two lone pairs of electrons. And what can happen is this partially positive uh, the charged hydrogen can form an electrostatic interaction with that lone pair of electrons on the partially negatively charged oxygen, and this is known as a hydrogen bond. Okay, so what can happen basically is that proteins, polypeptides, can fall back on themselves in this way, and this can continue on. You can form more of these folding backwards and forwards, and they're held together by these hydrogen bonds that form between the uh, the groups in the peptide link, as this is, okay? Now, when you have protein structure being determined by bonds which are uh, occurring as a result of interactions between the peptide links, that's known as a secondary uh, polypeptide structure or secondary protein structure. So these beta pleated sheets, as they're called, these sheets of the polypeptide, because it's going to form a sort of planar sheet. So this is known as a beta pleated sheet. This beta pleated sheet basically is an example of a secondary protein structure. And it's called a secondary protein structure because it's made, it, it forms this way because of these groups in the peptide links, so interactions between the groups in the peptide links. It's not formed by interactions between groups in the R groups, okay? So it involves only the uh, backbone of the polypeptide, the portions that are there for every single polypeptide, not, uh, not specific to your uh, amino acid coding, basically. Okay, so that's what's called a secondary protein structure. So now we've discussed what a beta-pleated sheet is. In the next video, I'll explain to you what a beta sandwich is.